We had a game, like we, we, we were deciding, oh, this was it. We were deciding on how to set up a room for the new master's program. Well, then rather than sit down and say, well, we should have this, we should have that, someone built a model of the room, life size, like small to scale, chairs, everything, and said, we have to fit 20 people in here. Figure it out. And just sitting there playing with it, sitting in the room going, well, what if we did this? We got so excited about the room, I was like, oh, I want to be here. You know, they never did put in the jacuzzi I suggested, but anyway, they don't take a lot of my suggestions. But what we found is we really got involved with the whole scenario. And it's the same thing that happens with you have children, adults, they like to do games. They like to get involved. They like to create. Because when you create, it's not rote, it's something new. And so this needing this at the front end is very important, but also tied into this, now we're talking about evaluation. That's the other thing with these programs, whether it's programs for literacy or the use of computer programs, is how do you know they work? How are you going to turn that? Now in, in government, they tend to use evaluation, the accountability framework, or RBAFs. Um, and they set it up to say, like, what are the inputs? What's the process? How are you going to achieve your results? So let's say you say, I'm going to make a program to improve literacy by 50%, okay? How are you going to do that? One, two, three, four. How, what are your short-term outcomes? Well, if students use this, they'll learn to write better on the test. What are your long-term outcomes? Now, what can be difficult in all these is that clear goals have to be decided. And this is more for program planning, as in setting up a literacy program, but it's the same thing for a computer program. How are you going to know you're having a long-term success? Or as you as practitioners, we want to use this program in our classes. We want to improve our literacy rates or our completion rates. Well, how are you going to know what those long-term outcomes are? And how can you demonstrate it to your providers who are saying, well, why should we keep funding you? You use this new program, and uh, how do we know it's working? Building that in at the front is a good idea, because you don't want to be in the position of one department I worked with, for example, that was trying to evaluate long-term outcomes. They were helping with disabilities. And they, one of their long-term outcomes was a more vibrant community. And I said, how are we going to measure that? And they said, well, you come up with that. I go. And I looked at my colleague and I went, well, we could go around asking like with Vibrantions or something. You know, we could just go out to people, do you feel more vibrant? I do. Look, people are smiling. It's more vibrant. Not to be silly. But the short, you know, I worked on another program where they worked that out in advance and it was very clear how they would measure their successes. Now, literacy, again, is not all quantitative. You can't always say, well, we had 73% of the people in the class, they all read and write much better. What about the person who is a little bit better at reading, but they feel better about themselves. Is that a success? Or they're more confident, they're gonna come back. That's a success. So, but again, thinking about those things is important because when you go to design programs, computer programs or policy programs, you need to know where you're going and where you want to be. So the four design process principles are, you know, early and continual testing. This is what people have to do with software. If they're gonna get people designing these programs for literacy, there's lots of testing. Measuring, how do you know what you are testing? And iterative design, meaning always learning as you're going. And we all do this. We use iterative design all the time. I'll try this. Oops, that didn't work. Okay, I'll try this. Oh, that worked. Okay, I'll do this. And we go around and we figure things out. That's how we develop our careers. Iterative. We don't have a total plan at the end. We have a rough idea where we want to go, but we learn as we go. And in integrating the design so it's all part of a package. So again, a software program is great. But you don't just go, okay, ooh, throw it at every educational institution. Ministries of education like to do that. You know, they like to have nice goodwill uh, campaigns where they go, we're putting more computers in Ontario's classrooms. No one knows how to use them, but we're putting more in. Or do they? Not to be facetious, but again, what does this do and how does it work? Um, again, you know, if you draw on things like the Canadian Evaluation Society, you know, they give standards and guidelines for evaluating programs. We need the same thing for if we're going to use technology applications in literacy, saying, well, how do we know this works? And, and how will it work for us? And more importantly, how can we use it to further our own goals? How can, are we, can we play with it? Can we change it? Can we make it suit us? So then, you know, the path ahead is, is that we need clear things four key things to really embrace technology and literacy together. We need clear policy support and funding for literacy. So, you know, I bet you know you were thinking I was just going to talk about technology, but there can be no discussion of technology without funding. As long as adult education and adult literacy receives one twentieth the funding of non-adult education, adult literacy is not going to go very far. 
and you must have clear policy objectives. They're very different across the country. It's very divided. It's coming closer together, but you need that support at the policy level. Two, you need to have users and teachers involved in the creation of these programs. And many program software companies are doing this. I'm sure yours is. More of that. Because teachers and learners are the greatest source of innovation for any company or software company trying to develop for those people. And to have a culture of learning, holism, and sharing. These technologies, anytime they foster that, that's a good technology. That's useful. And building evaluative tools into the programs helps you know you're getting on track. You know why it's working. You know, yes, it does have results. Yes, we should continue with this. But of course, what teachers and learners can do is compile what's right and wrong about these programs. If you use them when you're teaching, if you use them as a learner, tell people what works and what doesn't. They should listen. That's useful. Suggesting alternatives, maybe create them. Sharing your best practices, and hopefully after this you'll, you'll, you'll want to share some. Making partnerships with designers and industry. These are the things I'd like to see within the Literacy uh, Coalition, is making more of these connections, because there's a wealth of knowledge that, that can continue to flow in there. And that treating mistakes now as learning opportunities. Now again, that last one's a hard one, because in government, of course, whenever we have policy, we always have the policy of least regret. Government likes to have things work. They don't like to say, we spent over $50 million, it all went really bad, but we learned something. That doesn't sell so well. But the truth of the matter is, of course, is how we design anything, by making mistakes. Who here has ever learned by not making a mistake? I'm always waiting in one day, I'm going to have one person go, I'm perfect. <laughs> There's someone at the back with this halo, you know. Oh, okay, maybe not you. We all learn by making mistakes. From the first time we were two and we touched the hot stove and went, ow, we're not Homer, we don't do it three times. We learn. Mistakes are essential. Without mistakes, there is no growth. As Albert Einstein said, if you don't make mistakes, you must not be doing anything new. Ultimately, literacy itself is a technology. So when we talk about new technologies and literacy, we have a real new one. In evolutionary terms, we've only had writing for about 8,000 years. It's quite new. We're still trying to figure out how to do it and how to use it effectively. Many of the media technologies we're looking at now, from tweeting, texting. There was a Nielsen study that said, you know, teenagers send 3,000 or 3,300 texts per month. Send and then receive. That's eight per hour most days. I don't know how they do it. It's probably why many of them don't look up. Um, but that ability to use cell phones and text, put a program on there. They'll use it but also that ability to write. When you look at all the interactive media, well, video and all that, well, that's oral culture. Writing, PowerPoint presentations, well, that's just writing and pictures. What's different? It's just it's easier to share. But the fundamental skills are the same, and the learning is the same. The teachers, the learners, together. That hasn't changed. All these technologies can do is help make it a little bit easier for us to do more of what works, namely, working together. And that's my presentation. Thank you.